Good evening. My name is Bob Liff, and this is the CUNY Forum, a monthly town meeting that brings prominent New Yorkers together with faculty and students of the Edward T. Rogowski Internship Program in Government and Public Affairs. The path to democratic change is a long march, as they are finding out in major capitals around the world. Who knew one of the most resistant capitals would be Albany? On January 1st this year, Elliot Spitzer took control of the governor's office, vowing to change the culture of Albany's traditional secretive way of doing the people's business. After his first budget, you can't say everything has changed, though there has been incremental improvement. The budget was essentially negotiated behind closed doors, as it was under former Governor Pataki, as the tainted tradition of three men in a room held sway. The process led to a bit more spending than Spitzer proposed, and in major areas where he vowed dramatic changes, the result was much more limited. In health care, Spitzer succeeded in pairing some of the runaway Medicaid costs, but failed to block restorations to health care institutions demanded by an alliance of the state's largest health care union and the lobbying arm of the state hospitals. In education, legislators appeared to agree to a new funding formula that would dole out school aid based on need and then rewarded Long Island with extra money on top of the formula and cut some money from Westchester County in what, in what some saw as punishment for voters there electing a Democratic, a, a Democratic senator to replace an incumbent Republican in a state Senate chamber where Republicans hold a razor-thin margin. Now Spitzer has targeted that same, Republican, that same Republican majority with promises to push for an overhaul of, cam of, of campaign finance procedures, while, which, which while on one hand is modeled on good government politics, has the real world effect of threatening, of threatening Senate Majority Leader Joe Bruno's attempt to hold on to control of the chamber. Is it a case that the more things change, the more they stay the same? We're joined by four New Yorkers who take part in that debate over how Albany spends your money, how that translates into services for the residents of New York City. Michael Keogh is the Director of Finance for the New York City Council, which is in negotiations with Mayor Bloomberg right now over our municipal budget. Elizabeth Lynham is the Deputy Research Director for the Citizens Budget Commission, for the Citizens Budget Commission, excuse me, which has long been a voice in the city and state for transparent and rational budgeting, particularly in the area of debt service and capital spending. Elizabeth Benjamin writes the influential Daily Politics blog for the Daily News and until recently wrote the similarly influential Capital Confidential blog for her former employer, the Albany Times Union. And Anne Michaud is the award-winning editor of The Crane's Insider, a daily newsletter that covers the intersection of politics and government. Elizabeth Lynham, let me start with you. Um, now that we've gone through the first budget up in the state, uh, I think CBC described it as modest achievements. I mean. Uh, Give me some assessment of how they did. Well, I think they had set out some very lofty goals for themselves, and particularly in the two areas that you identified, uh, health care spending and school aid uh, changes. And uh, what they ended up with through the process of compromise and negotiation in the final weeks of the budget negotiation was less than what they had hoped. And I think everyone's in the process of figuring out where to go from here. Uh, Medicaid spending has long been an area where the state needs to do some substantial cost containment and change the way it offers benefits to preserve benefits to the poor, essentially. And the school aid changes they got, uh, while they did succeed in adding an element of rationality to the way the money is doled out, uh, they had to increase uh, spending in certain areas of the state to get that and essentially put too, a little too much money into greasing the wheels to get those political compromises through. Uh, Mike, let me ask you, um, how did the uh, city do it? They, they cut the uh, kind of revenue-sharing money this, uh, this year, the, the, aid, the aid to municipalities, which is about $300 million, I think. How did the city on balance do? Uh, on balance, the city did uh, uh, better uh, than it had originally uh, uh, feared uh, as the budget process in Albany was first unfolding. Uh, while it's true uh, there is a cut to that, uh, there is the, uh, the plan to restore it in fiscal year 09. Uh, and you were talking about the uh, the Medicaid cuts uh, uh, or lack of cuts uh, thereof. Uh, the Medicaid program also, though, benefits the city because by moving more towards uh, needs and institutions that are actually providing services for Medicaid patients, such as HHC, the Health and Hospitals Corporation in New York City, uh, will also reap uh, benefits uh, from that as that program uh, moves forward. And we're also seeing uh, a turnaround uh, in the education aid that the city is getting, which is uh, the first time that we've had a plan. Uh, to have those increases uh, come through, and it's uh, a comprehensive plan that will be played out over the next uh, few years. And um, this is a rookie governor who came in uh, day one, everything changes. Did everything mm -hmm. change day one? 
Well, um, I think there were signs that this is a rookie governor uh, in the way the negotiation happened. I think um, the governor found himself backed into a corner between um, getting an on-time budget and um, being able to get all the things he wanted. And, and in the end, he managed to negotiate things behind closed doors, as you uh, referred to earlier. And uh, he's taken a lot of um, public criticism from the good government groups for that. I think um, he's aware of that from what I heard, I've seen him say over the past um, weeks. And um, he's talked about starting the budget process earlier for next year and also creating uh, executive um, uh, hearings on the budget, so, which is normally the province of the legislature, but he's talking about making this pro process so open by his own um, executive design. Um, Liz, you've spent a lot of years in Albany. Um, could you, can you see this process changing? Can you see it opening up? I mean, that's kind of, sunshine is the best disinfectant has not held sway in Albany. No, but in addition, what you mentioned earlier was that it was um, three men in a room, sort of the, what we've always talked about. That behind Actually, five men in a room because they threw in the minority. Well, that was last year. Right. Right. They've right. gone out of three It was still all men. It was historically, <laughs> well, right. It, it was historically uh, three men in a room, and then under George Pataki, it was five men in a room. This year, it was more like two men in a room because what happened, you had a governor who was negotiating with. Joe Bruno, who's a Republican, so you have a Democratic governor who's a rookie, as Ann said. He's negotiating with Joe Bruno, who's the embattled majority leader, trying to hold on to his majority, as you mentioned earlier. And when they were negotiating and really fighting, I mean, cer that certainly is what came through to the press, and it leaked out all over the place. And then when they got close to a deal, when it was time to bring in Shelley Silver, the Democrat, who's the leader of the Assembly, Joe Bruno said, you know, you bring your guy along. You know, why should we have three guys in a room when you have the Democratic majority in the Assembly ostensibly working for you? Is that how the budget is done in the city? Obviously, the answer is no. I mean, the city is, <laughs> a, the, you know, the truth is the city is a good Make example. it a lot quicker. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I mean, we have mandated uh, uh, process. It starts with the mayor's uh, preliminary budget uh, towards the end of January. We did our alternative spending plan uh, after hearings on the mayor's plan. Uh, we just did ours a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we'll be later this week uh, getting the mayor's executive budget, and then we'll do a, another round of public hearings uh, on those. And uh, uh, through that process, we'll have a final adoption uh, in June. Okay, well, to be fair, there is a process in Albany. It's just that what happens at these hearings and, and conference committees that occur, what happened this year was that one side came to the table, and the, which was the Republicans, and then they held this big theater and, and railed on the Democrats for not showing up. So right, they held, they held, there, right. there is a process. It's just that no one's <laughs> adhering to it. Well, but I think there is an important distinction about the standards that the city actually uses in order to do its budget. The city has a very tight standard coming out of the fiscal crisis in the 70s. It balances its budget according to generally accepted accounting principles, which gives it a lot less room to finagle. The state is on a cash basis, and it's important because the state can explain manipulate the, explain funds. Explain the differences, if you would. <laughs> well, the accounting principles that the city has to live by mean that when the revenues come in, they're recognized at the time they come in, and the same thing with the spending they have to do. The state can just put the bills under the desk blotter, pull them out when it wants to pay them, and that's when they appear on its books. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, state has a track record of using that kind of manipulation and covering deficits and rolling funds from year to year in ways that get it into trouble. So the city is cleaner in its openness and transparency and accountability. It's also cleaner in the very standard it uses by which it reports and accounts for its finances. And the state would be wise to look to the city for an example and actually in some of this fast track that they're talking about um, doing this year, to try to you know, do a preliminary budget earlier on. One of the things the city does that's so great is well before the start of the fiscal year, they already are presenting a budget that shows you how they're going to handle the coming year. And the state waits till very late on to do that. The executive budget in January is really the first time that they get a chance to look at it. And there really isn't a lot of time until the fiscal year starts on April 1st to have the legislative involvement that we see in the city and really let the process be very open. So they could try to change that and do some fast track well, around. They have talked about it. it. I mean, they've talked about maybe moving the deadline 
instead of April 1, which is very rapid, maybe to May. The problem is that you need a constitutional amendment to do that, which means it has to be passed by two differently elected legislatures and then subsequently going to the people as a referendum to pass. I mean, it's not an easy lift and it's kind of not that sexy to send it to the voters and, and say, hey, budget reform. You know, it's not, except it's that, not right, that great. Except that it's also the case that, you know, the city and localities all all around the state depend on those numbers to know how much they're going to send out and to send out their property tax right. bills to send out their school tax bills. We don't pay a separate school tax. But the fiscal but, years uh, don't jive either, which is another problem. Well, I thought, right. that the, I thought the theory was always that the state goes first, so that all the localities can then can then figure out how much mm -hmm. they have to, you know, how much they have to charge because those, those it, tax bills have to go out. It helps in terms of planning mm -hmm. uh, if you know what your state share uh, is, and also uh, it helps in terms of um, uh, that they're on t separate tracks, uh, so that you do have the ability to make adjustments um, uh, if the, for the unforeseen. Uh, expenditure or crisis that may uh, occur, and one can help the other. And the um, you know the insider covers politics and government. Where do those two come together more than in than in the budget process? Right. And what we saw this year, particularly in the area of healthcare, we saw the series of ads done by the mm -hmm. by local 11.9 and the uh, by local 11.99 and the Greater New York Hospital Association, basically saying, I mean, there was the one ad about the 95-year-old woman saying, uh, Governor Spitzer, how could you do this to mm -hmm. me? Um, how do you, I mean, that clearly plays against the kind of openness and rational budgeting that Elizabeth was talking about. Mm -hmm. Well, I think Governor Spitzer might have underestimated the uh, the cabal of the lobby, lobbying industry and legislators that um, ended up fighting him. I think they spent eight to ten million dollars is what I've heard. And um, but I also think that that this that Governor Spitzer didn't use his strongest weapon, which was himself. He had ads that had crying babies in a nursery, and you know it's very entertaining to to say, "Oh well, these are cry babies asking for this money." But I think um, you had an extraordinarily popular governor. You have people who believe in him and and trust him, and he should have been in the one in, in those ads explaining what was going on and his viewpoint and really appealing directly to the voters. He kind of petered out is the problem, and he 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 basically introduced this budget, and he had these little palm cards that he actually paid for himself. They're like little credit card sized cards, and they basically said, you know, here's my budget proposal and why my budget proposal is very good. The spending was very high, even at the outset. You said they got more out of him, the legislature did, but it was high to begin with, mm -hmm. over, you know, I mean, it was over $120 billion, mm -hmm. which is high. Right. So They added about a billion dollars. They did. A billion dollars that. more. He started with 7.8 percent on a state funds basis as his opening bid, yeah, which, which is very high. Yeah, which is higher than people expected, I think, right. from this guy. But then he, he, so he subsequently said, I'm going to go all over the state and I'm going to argue, bring my argument to the people because the people um, said, gave me a mandate. I was elected with 69 percent of the vote, which is historic, et cetera. And he did a little traveling, but he just didn't, I, I agree with you, he just didn't really bring it out as much as he could have. And uh, part of the problem is, again, this compressed timetable. Mm -hmm. You just don't have that much time to be all over the state and be hitting people. And he got caught up in this whole state controller battle. And I think that that really took away, and he, he expended a lot of political capital there, and he lost. Let me ask, um, there's a political capital question, and there's also an institutional question. And, and, you know, I covered, as a reporter, I covered city budgets for years and years and years at a city hall. And you would come and you would come to the last night of the budget, and people would be haggling over the last $30 million or so $300 million of what was then a $35 billion budget, now a $50 plus billion budget. And I'm wondering if Spitzer um, underestimated the legitimate institutional prerogative of the legislature as an equal partner in this budget. Mayors have traditionally tried to kind of grab power from the council, and the council is very reluctant to give that power up. And this is not just a civics lesson. This is played out in real life every time you do a budget. Well, I think though also though what uh, what happens, especially with the newly elected uh, uh, official in the in, in the role, is is that they also realize at the end of the day, yes, I have a vision, yes, I have to do things, but they also have the responsibility of getting a budget that's actually passed through the legislature, mm -hmm. and there are compromises that have to be made, um, uh, and because the priorities uh, are different, and I think that every executive expects that their budget is going to be added to, and when the governor first proposed his uh, budget, 
Uh, he and his budget director both said that they expected that the legislature would seek to add spending to the budget, and they were not putting any lines in the sand saying that they can only uh, pass this budget. A very different circumstance, I think, that you had, though, when you covered uh, uh, Rudy Giuliani's first uh, couple of budgets where he attempted to actually do that uh, and say that there were no lines in the sand and then had to retreat and make a deal to get things passed through the council. Mm -hmm. But this fight about power, the struggle for power between the executive and the legislative branches at many levels of government, obviously, is sort of age old. I mean, you're talking about an argument that has been going on and even went to court between Pataki and the legislature. And then subsequently, there was a proposition that was passed twice. It was a constitutional amendment where the legislature tried to take more power for itself. And Spitzer came out against it before he was even elected. So mm -hmm. let's remember that you've got a very strong executive power state in New York. And this guy would like to keep it that way. Certainly any governor would like to keep it that way. Well, I think that what happened in the end was that he got bookended by the start of the fiscal year and the calculation about the this sort of pain of having to bear another late budget. You know, he comes mm -hmm. in and he's promising reform and then how can he get this budget done in the time parameters and so he basically went behind closed doors at the a very late hour only a couple weeks before the end of the fiscal year and really at one point he was threatening to shut down government and saying that a better budget would be worth the pain of you know the political difficulties of a shutdown and and of taking and a budget that went beyond it. april he 1st backed right off and it. then he really did back off and start compromising so it's unclear sort of how he made that calculation and what in the final days he was thinking about in well, terms I think it's of his wisely, mandate wisely in. though mm -hmm. he backed off though because um, there is, there are there's severe consequence uh, for when the uh, the legislature has to pass a budget without the executive uh, you saw the litigation uh, a lot of uh, spending uh, and planning that has to occur that cannot occur the same thing happened when the one year where the council passed its own budget over Mayor Giuliani's objections, pending uh, was impounded, uh, litigation ensued. Uh, a lot of institutions that count on the funding was not able to get it. So it really is incumbent upon whatever position you want to get to actually make a deal for something that can be passed Explain through the legislature. Explain that just a bit because this is not because this affects people's lives. I mean, it this does. is not an academic or a pardon the expression, good government. Debate. I mean, this. I mean, this affects those kinds of debates you have. In, you have in the council, and they have in Albany. What does it? What does it mean to the average New Yorker? Well, instance? everyone talks about uh, you know, like well, spending's out of control and so on, like that. And they make it sound like you're going out and getting plasma TVs for everybody. When in reality, what you're doing is you're paying for uh, people to provide a service, um, whether it's paying for police officers or state troopers, or whether it's paying for uh, healthcare professionals or teachers, or, or whether it's paying for a not-for-profit group to fill a gap that a local government is not doing themselves. Um, these are things that we are, are all paying for. Uh, one way or another, and the mayor's uh, uh, anti-poverty commission, uh, for example, uh, has a number of different initiatives uh, that don't even necessarily go to city agencies, but are planned to go to uh, help groups that work with uh, poor and indigent uh, uh, clientele uh, to get them to a point where they can be more self-sufficient. Those are real-term consequences and real choices that you have to make. So if you don't pass a budget, you're not going to solve those problems, and the people who are doing that work are not going to get paid for those services. And some pork, right? I mean, you have to admit you have to admit that there's some pork in the budget. I mean, there is pork is a meal. Yes, pork is a meal. I'm sorry, <laughs> community projects or whatever it is that you want to call them. I think that there is stuff in that budget, and this is part of the argument about why it's good to have hearings and to be having a slow process so people know exactly what's in there. These budget bills that this legislature passed with messages of necessity were warm. Okay, I put my hands on the budget bills and they were warm, which means that they had just come off the Xerox machine. Nobody read those bills. Which means the people who voted on them hadn't read them. No they idea what was them. in there. And of course, then later, you, there are problems that come out and you find out what they are. And you have to go back and you fix it and they call it a budget cleanup bill. <laughs> well, so. I heard that they, that they had the budget printed and as, with an assumption that it would be late and that they had to go back and print it once the decision was made for it to be on time, they had to go back and, and rewrite pieces of it. Well, right. I mean, based on the deals that they make at the 11th hour, right up until the end, there's horse trading going on in terms of, and it really does come down, as you said, to the last 30 million, although, I mean, it comes down to a very small amount of spending that people are fighting about, and it really is about, 
if you don't like the word pork, you can say something else, but it's about who gets what projects in their district for economic development and, you know, if there's going to be something downstate, then there has to be something of parity upstate because Joe Bruno represents upstate. I mean, it really becomes a mess, basically, and, um, and a trade-a-thon at the end. Well, but the real, I mean, the real, to take the big picture and not necessarily pork or anything else, it doesn't really serve the public interest to have a budget that is not sustainable in the long run. That's right. You know, the services are going forward and people need to plan for those services to continue. And here we have a situation in which the state has a very large multi-billion dollar surplus and they're spending quite a bit of it to support operating spending, which means when they don't have that, they're going to have to scramble to find ways going forward to, to support it. They added a lot of spending. They were at 7.8 going in. Uh, with the legislature, they finished closer to nine. I mean, that's an enormous spending increase at a time when we have huge revenue growth, and really, they have a five billion dollar gap. Uh, you know that they'll have to face closing in about eighteen months. So. It's not as though there's no price to what they added. They do need to figure out how to balance it, how to pay for it for the long run interests of the services that they are providing. And that's really the part that is of concern. Um, whether they added, you know, pork here, a couple hundred million to, you know, those are big numbers, but the state budget is $120 billion budget and you know it does affect a lot of a lot of institutions a lot of people but it is really the question about sustainability that we face new york has the highest combined tax burden as a share of personal income of any state and you know that tax burden has a cost also that needs to be factored in and if we keep adding 9% a year you know, where do we go um, with that tax burden and the and the particular difficulties in upstate New York where the economy is not as strong? True. When you talk about long-term planning, I mean, part of the long-term plan was this um, education uh, program to settle CFA. And so the we... Campaign for fiscal equity lawsuit. Right. right. So, and which added a lot of money in spending for New York City, as was referenced earlier. But when you're talking about going forward, that that level of spending, in my estimation, and I think other people's estimation, cannot be sustainable over a long period of time unless other areas are subsequently reduced, right? So the idea is that the next budget battle, I would be willing to predict, again, will be Medicaid next year. You're going to see this whole question of reimbursements is going to come up and the issue of closures of hospitals and, and facilities and, and consolidation and the savings of that and where that's going to go and the HIP conversion. I mean, all of this stuff is going to come back. It's the same sort of thing thing that we're de dealing with in part because the levels of increased spending just can't be sustained. Well, well here's where um, politics would intersect, as, as you would say, Bob. Um, I've been, I live on Long Island and I've been getting a lot of um, emails from my state senator bragging about how much they were able to get for the schools in the final hours of negotiation. And you can call it pork, but I think you have to have... Um, there's a balance of interest there. The state senate will be up for election next year, and um, it, there's a very real chance that that they'll lose. The Republicans will lose the majority. That's what two, two seats, seats away. But that yeah. wasn't pork. That was incumbency protection. That's that's a little mm -hmm. bit different. But I mean, that was well, also. But you play, but incumbency protection is played out by giving member items and giving pork, certainly. and putting more money into districts, which is why Westchester. Some people argue suffered because they elected a Democrat to replace a Republican state senator. Right. So that's why Long Island did a lot better in extra in extra money than Westchester. But County it dilutes did. the whole argument of this issue of foundation formula funding, which is what the governor said that he wanted to make, mm -hmm. which is breaking the back of so-called shares based on you get education aid based on how, the percentage of students that you have and not on need. In mm -hmm. other words, and this, the governor is big on need, need for education aid, need for um, Medicaid aid, etc. Mm -hmm. Put the money, it makes a lot of sense, put the money where the people need it, right? But the problem is when you say you've broken foundation aid and then you turn around and you give high tax aid on top of that, which is how they made the excuse of giving the money to Long Island mm -hmm. and then how Westchester got kind of out of the mix there. They've got high taxes too, but which is political. I mean, that sort of dilutes your whole argument. If you're willing to break the shares, uh, the shares um, way of doling out money and then you say you go to foundation, but then you turn around and, and change it, next year you, make, you try and make the same argument and it's completely diluted. Well, next year really will be the key. I mean, right now, as I said, uh, everyone is basically trying to assess the final details, what happened, mm -hmm. how much reform was gained, how much was lost. But next year, I think the idea is that, um, you know, the reform community has to come together and say, look, 
you know, the governor came in on a reform ticket, and we need to have New Yorkers press reform and good government groups press reform, additional transparency, whatever changes need to be made to bring some rationality back into the decision making. Um, and really, this, the, the test is going to be next year. How will the ad campaigns roll out um, mm -hmm. this year in a, in a different twist? You know, the governor had mounted his own ads, which is not something we'd seen in the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, will that be more aggressive? Of course, the, the lobby groups will run their own ads again. You know, it'll be the same kind of cycle that unfolds. Uh, it'll, it'll just be a question of how, how much the public is willing to stand with that reform agenda and really say, yeah, we're going we're gonna to do this. We're going to support the me, uh, changes that we see need to happen, that we voted for. First, let me do one brief thing, which is a defense of member items, which always get attacked <laughs> as pork because, um, a meal. I, because I've, seen it, I've <laughs> seen it in the council. I see I, on the I, meal. I, <laughs> no, I've seen it in the council and I've seen it, you know, on the state level, is that individual members get a pot of money to fund programs in their own districts that might not otherwise get funded on yeah. a broader basis. That don't get the, funded on a broader basis. That, that really is that really the, is the point. The difference is that on the city council level, it's a lot more transparent in terms of finding out which member is supporting which item, while on the state on the state level, that information is buried. We print so, uh, we print a separate schedule listing every uh, local so, I mean, initiative in, that is in Albany. Uh, one of the yes. I mean, the irony is a nice word is that they negotiate that they're <laughs> negotiating transparency behind closed doors, which is kind of a good metaphor for how, for how this is done. Spitzer has done something else that hasn't been done, and that's, the, and that's attack the culture in a very direct way by going after individual members who yeah. disagree with him. Mm -hmm. He did that first when they, when they named Mr. DiNapoli, and he went into individual members, Democrats as well as yeah. Republicans, went into individual members' districts and said, your guy, your woman, is a bum not not <laughs> supporting reform. In Syracuse, now, yeah. yeah. Now in he's Westchester. pushing campaign yeah. finance because the you know now that they've done with the budget, you get into the area of program bills and he's going after, you know, two areas in particular that are the lifeblood in particular of the Republican of the Republican majority in the Senate. Remember, we have nineteen million people in this state and the, to show you the power of map makers when they draw districts, you can create you can divide up those same people with and give the Democrats a 65-seat majority in the state assembly, and the Republicans a two-seat majority in the state Senate, which means that creative map making is a very <laughs> powerful but tool. And now he's going right after them, and he was in the and on, he wants to change the way people are able to fund politics. That's going right at their bread and butter. Mm -hmm. Well, the the thing is here, though. I mean, the places that he went. I mean, it would be one thing if he was going after places where you knew that the senator was so-called safe. What he's doing, and I'm sorry for my cynical point of view here, but it's entirely political. And, and to his credit, he has mm -hmm. argued, I mean, he has admitted, rather, I want the Senate to be in Democratic hands because I think I can get my agenda achieved better if we have de Democrats on one side and Democrats on the other, and I'm a Democrat, et cetera. But the problem is, um, and we could talk about single party government and the dangers of that all day because we saw what happened at the federal level um, when that occurred, but he goes after backbenchers, so-called, people who are um, really not all that powerful, who are marginal in districts that could go either way, who are arguably weak. And he is really getting the legislature sort of up in arms and a little bit banded against him in, in so well, much as... Well, he did that in the Comptroller fight. Right. Absolutely. But also now you go after people and they're like, hey, that, that guy's kind of not so bad. Why don't you pick on somebody your own mm -hmm. size, steamroller? I mean, you know, I think that a lot of people feel in the legislature like um, he's, uh, you know, going, he's picking fights with people who really are uh, arguably too weak to fight back and uh, makes them angry. Well, I mean, I mean, you know, the, you know if you're a bully, you better be able to carry it out because the degree to which he was not able to kind of steamroll his way to larger wins potentially weakens him as he goes forward in this kind of internal battle within... But for the record, bully Albany. did not cross my lips, okay? Bob <laughs> said bully. <laughs> not me. You said steamroller. steamroller, right. I'm okay with well, that. Well, I don't think that voters necessarily know that when the governor comes to my district to criticize my uh, legislator that that he's doing it because this is a backbencher who's not not powerful i mean i don't think no they you don't can, uh, you don't make that differentiation you, you might just think this person stinks you might but but also we talked earlier about negotiations and the need to compromise spitzer was a prosecutor before i mean he had all these accolades as ag mm -hmm. he was the sheriff of wall street the white knight blah blah etc um 
the problem, the difference between being the AG, and we're seeing Andrew Cuomo getting similar accolades now with the student loan investigation, which I'm sure means a lot to this audience, but you know, you're seeing that the difference in style. So yes, it's a gr I agree with you that it might play very well with voters, but if you can't get anything done with the legislature where you need, you're need you angering mm -hmm. them because you're going after people and then you can't get negotiations and you wonder why and then you go back out and rail on them and you mm -hmm. come back and you can't get anything done, I mean, certainly at the voting booth, maybe it'll work, but it's a year and change till the voting booth. In the meantime, the guy's got to govern. Right. And I hear that it's not about party in Albany. It's about institutions. It's not Democrat versus Republican. It's the the executive, the state senate, and the well, assembly. Yeah. Yes well, and no. I mean, he said straight out he wants Republicans um, out of the state senate majority. Yeah, but his but his battles early on were with the dem were more with the Democratic assembly because the first big fight was over the comptroller. Over the comptroller. And Joe Bruno was saying, "You all have at it. You know, let me <laughs> let me let me hold you know let me hold your coats." Yeah, but then right. but then Joe Bruno allowed his member allowed released his members to vote as they wanted, and some of his members voted for DiNapoli too. In fact, more of his members voted for DiNapoli than voted for Martha Stark, which is the person that uh, came out of the yes, panel. Yes, but the that state Spitzer senate wanted. Democrats, you know, I mean, this yes, is they kind hung of a weird thing. Spitzer, it's voted true. unanimously for Martha Stark, and somehow that was an act of vision. When the people who voted <laughs> unanimously for Tom DiNapoli were almost unanimously were act were in an act of political. <laughs> Chicanery. There's hypocrisy right. so, in all yes, <laughs> Well, but again, I mean, so the big picture here, you know, the case really is with the public. I mean, you know, uh, you you wander up to Albany and you say, why is it, why is the culture? What are the things that will change the culture here? And part of it is that the public needs to demand change, and the public needs to understand what's happening. And so many people have said that the strategy should have been for him to negotiate. Um, you know, that just kind of re reifies those institutions. And what's really needed there is to, to really shake things up and to say, you know, we need to take it to the people that this needs to be different, that the, the people cannot be fickle about what they are going to demand from their leadership in the state. I agree with you, Elizabeth, but then he shouldn't turn around and go behind closed doors and make deals. I mean, either he's a reformer or he's not a reformer, right? So he's going to either go around and shake it up and then he's going to actually um, risk, and, I, and I'm sorry, I'm not advocating for government shutdown because I know what happened to Newt Gingrich and it's bad, et cetera, but you know, you're know, you either going to really rattle the cage or you're not. You can't be half except rattling and half even, not rattling. That, except that, I, and, I, and I do want to go to a question, but you made the point earlier that reality set in that the budget deadline was coming up. He had the choice of making this wonderful stand or getting a budget done. I mean, up until he should have waited ago, a week. We That's my opinion. <laughs> well, he, he could have waited a week. A week and later yeah. was Passover and Easter. It was right, two right. weeks it's true. They were it was on bad, break. bad timing. But he he kind of looked a little bit wimpy. I mean, or at least wishy washy to say like maybe a government shutdown to float that out there and then back away from it, go behind closed doors, pass a budget with messages of necessity, which he said he didn't want to do. I mean, all this stuff, it's like, you know, you're either on one side of the line or you're on the other side of the line. If, to me, and I know Albany is, if, is nothing if not a, a million shades of gray, but well, what did he, what a little did, black and white would be nice what here, he, you know. What did he tell a columnist at the Daily News? I'm Lyndon Johnson. I get, yeah. I get, I get, I'll get things done. It was not me. You just <laughs> write it was not, it Well, but you. in the interim, there was a Quinnipiac poll that showed that his popularity was going down. But he doesn't and the govern by were polls, he says. Him. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, the public needs to kind of hold fast and not be as fickle in their mm -hmm. right. their views. Let me go to a question, please. Uh, uh, tell, us, tell us tell us, your name and your campus. Boris Noble, Brooklyn College. Mm -hmm. uh, is it possible to say that the reason that Albany always has a late budget is unlike the city council, they have a large Republican opposition? Very, very good point. You have essentially a one-party government in New York City. Even the mayor, who's registered Republican, is essentially a Democrat. Um, Again, and I used to work that. for him. Yeah. Too, so, um, <laughs> but, uh, no, I, I don't know that um, uh, that uh, the fact that um, uh, that there are only three Republicans uh, uh, has that effect, uh, because you have everybody in the city council uh, from uh, all different uh, uh, representing all different. Uh, Neighborhoods and uh, income uh, demographics and uh, uh, ethnic demographics. Uh, so everybody brings a very different mix, and you uh, and no one has uh, the same point of view. It's not like everyone's monolithic about that, and you have to spend some time 
uh, to try to get to a point where you get compromise uh, so that, A, we could put out an alternative uh, to the mayors, and then after we've done that internally, we have to uh, uh, get the mayor to come on board uh, in some fashion. So it's, that's one reason why our process planning from January to June for adoption uh, uh, helps us the time to but get all also, that done. But, but you, you meaning we, as you know, <laughs> since I'm a city resident, um, you know, we have to do four-year financial planning. Yes. That, you know, we still live, as, as Elizabeth said, with the aftermath of the 1975-1976 municipal, uh, municipal funding crisis, where we have all these kind of external controls. I mean, you know, New York City is a creation of Albany. If the legislature wanted to, they could vote us out of existence. We, and we're still and living under the Financial Control Act, which you know, expires uh, in June million, of 08. If we're $100 million in the hole, if we're $100 million in the hole at the end of the year, technically the state could take over yes. our finances. But yeah. That's part of the reason why the budget was late for so many years in Albany, and it wasn't this year, and it wasn't the two previous years for a variety of reasons, is because the budget was so frequently coupled with contentious legislation, which was held hostage, in effect, to the budget. So we all may recall the rent control battle, which of course was huge here, and that was a big fight that held the budget hostage for months. And so what Spitzer did, to his credit this year, was decouple some contentious legislation like civil confinement for sex offenders or um, uh, workers' compensation reform and get those things done Discreetly. before the budget. And because if you had tied that, now you know we're seeing also they kicked out Wix law reform and also campaign finance reform, which were discussions for for those kind of agreements were going on simultaneously as the budget was going along but he made a decision or the legislative leaders agreed we are not going to tie this because then the budget can go on forever if you do that well and will those things get done without the pressure of a budget deadline I don't know mm, campaign finance maybe Wix I don't know I mean it, it's hard to say right now because so many things are up in the air mm -hmm. it, it's possible but you know you got to leave something for next year right? as a <laughs> former reporter I'm also convinced that if the capital was in New York City and had a lot more coverage, I think there would be a lot more pressure on them. But because Albany is, at least from our chauvinistic and parochial oh, point of view, kind of this remote town somewhere up near, Mon somewhere up near Montreal, oh, that you know we don't pay as <laughs> much attention to it as we should because of its power over us. I think that is, you know, it's, I think that um, as a former reporter, that you know, our, our failure to cover Albany more intensely is. Uh, not a is a, not a good thing. Yes, sir. Tell us. Tell us your name and your campus. Hi, I'm James Nelson, Brooklyn College. Good evening. My question um, is, as far as the budget is, who determines uh, the budget and what aspect, as far as um, from Medicaid to housing? How is the budget? You know, how is it developed? Mm. Well, the governor um, uh, proposes uh, uh, his spending plan first. The governor has the power to set the revenues. Uh, the legislature, it doesn't become a budget, though, until the legislature uh, actually passes it into law. They also present both houses, the Senate and the Assembly, present uh, their own uh, alternative spending plan after they do do a round of public hearings. Um, and uh, uh, it's after that occurs that negotiations uh, between the governor and the uh, uh, legislature ensue. There are also, I mean, in a perfect world, they agree on revenues, which means what's available to spend. And then they break up into different committees, which have targets of spending. So the, there's the Parks Committee that talks about, okay, well, we have a target of 300 million, and we're going to allocate it in this way. Or, you know, we have, um, you know, corrections, addresses, prison issues. But the most contentious issues are the ones that get, you know, uh, negotiated by the leaders behind closed doors largely. And this is sort of a perennial argument in Albany is that the rank and file lawmakers really don't have all that much to do mm -hmm. and they really don't have all that much to say. Except that, right. except that even if they don't have that much to say, a legislature still has internal politics. A governor is a decider of one. Right. And while, you know, obviously the leaders are first among equals by far, it, you know, it's still three men in a room, not a hundred, not two hundred. Well, they have to respond to the room, desires of their but conferences. But they still have to respond to their own membership. They yeah, have right. to reach an internal consensus. I mean, that a governor does to some degree with his own staff, but the governor is the ultimate decider. Mm -hmm. well, so, well, so the I mean, leaders the nature control of them, the, though. The nature of the two institutions is very different. Yes, but the leaders also have a certain amount of power 
of the Assembly and the Senate because they dole out things like Lulu's, which is the the extra money that you get for heading a committee. They make a decision on who gets what in terms of um, member yeah. items, pork, etc., and they make decisions decisions in terms of largely based on seniority, but allocations of staff resources and how much money you get and where your office is and, and all that other stuff. And to try to open that up it requires people who are benefiting from that system to vote it out of existence. Well, that's, that's why it's so difficult, right? Well, trying I, to reform. I think there are a lot of legislators who would like to participate more, and certainly as pressure has grown for reform, they have made efforts, they have the conference committee process. Yeah. The problem is, is that they really have not developed, you know, it's, it's a new, it's a budding, it's a budding thing. And so what you mm -hmm. see on the federal level, for example, you have committee chairs who develop strong substantive interests in their topics, and at the, the legislature in New York State, we haven't seen that quite that committee hold yet. And what happens is, you know, like they right. did this year, they're making decisions about these targets for committees, the leadership passes those down. And then the committees deal on the margins. And this year, because they couldn't settle, they actually were supposed to have meetings that nobody knew what the targets were, what the spending right. levels were. And so they were completely reduced to having kind of these show hearings rather mm -hmm. than dealing in any substance. And, and so it's... It's got to be frustrating for a rank-and-file lawmaker to come to a meeting of, of what's called, and I'm not kidding, the mothership, which is a <laughs> committee that controls all the other budget committees on which the leadership sits. That would be Shelley and Joe Bruno and Denny Farrell, who's the head of Ways and Means, and Owen Johnson, who's the head of Finance on the Senate side, and this doles out those targets to the tables. So it's demeaning when the lawmakers come to find out the targets at the same time the reporters come. So in other words, the lawmakers don't have any other insight other than the media, they're supposed to be running the government, right? They're all sitting there like, okay, so what's my table target so I can figure out what it is? Yes, sir. Good evening. Sam Schlifko, CUNY Honors College at Brooklyn College. My question is, what recommendations would you give to Governor Spitzer and the New York State Assembly uh, to ensure that the budget gets out on time and models the effectiveness of the New York City Council? Well, I, I would <laughs> say... That is your Good purview. Uh -huh. I would I say that... Uh, <laughs> It, the process needs to start earlier. I think it needs to be more open. I think if there were some effort to try to look ahead to that next year, a cycle earlier than they do, say in November, December, and really try to move the debate, almost accelerate the executive budget, which is now produced in January, put that a, a few months earlier, begin the process. Now, you know, people will argue that even if they do that, they can still stonewall at the last minute and hold out. But again, this is about the process of changing a culture and trying to put the responsibility for bad action on the people who are acting badly. And the earlier you start it and the more open you are at the executive administrative level, the better. And I think also the fiscal year should be changed. New York is very um, much alone in its, in its April 1 start. Uh, July 1 would probably be better to model the city. The state should have better accounting standards. It, you know, it should try to do better reporting um, according to the same kind of s standards that the city uses so that this cash manipulation is prohibited. Um, it should do um, a better job reporting its financial plan. They have added a year this year, so they should continue and do that longer term horizon uh, so that people can really see the implications of what's happening in future years from the decisions they're making today. So there are, there are a number of things that could be done. Do you want to answer that, or you would? You know, I think that the 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 experiment that they're doing with conference committees uh, should be encouraged. Uh, it, it should grow over time. It, uh, the congressional one grew over a very long period of time to the point where it is today. And I think that uh, those uh, uh, those kinds of reforms, uh, uh, if you can get any of them done, you'll get to uh, a, a product that will have some more transparencies. Um, but. Uh, at the end of the day, um, uh, as long as you have folks who are realizing that they have to come together and they have to um, actually pass the budget and that it makes some sense and have some rationality for it, um, then you'll, you'll, get to, you'll get to that as long as you have those folks um, who will make those decisions going Well, forward. I mean, it's true. I mean, New York State is only about, what, 230 years old, so it's, it, takes, <laughs> it, takes it, takes time. Bit, it takes a little bit of time. It takes time. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Yulia Cabrera. I'm from John Jay College of Criminal Justice. And my question is, is, do you think that all negotiations and debates should be open to the public, or there are some situations where um, um, 
things have to be done behind closed doors, like, for example, in cases where public doesn't possess a necessary or certain level of expertise, and public, um, maybe politicians are afraid that public won't understand, the understand in the right of, way. You know, the in, uh, power won't. of emotionalism, right? Yeah. That, that, that can, that, you know, I mean, talk about the, the, well, the value of going behind closed doors. If you, well, there's two There's got to be a balance, if you did and this a, balance is totally out, <laughs> I'm not of, sure out I believe of balance. I'll be, I'll be definitely, I'm not going to argue in favor of closed doors, but I, and I'm not a lawmaker, right? And I would like to see more things. The thing is, when you see it all in public, it's generally sanitized, and it's frequently staged. And you, you a lot of people don't feel... Because they play to the cameras, right. they play to and the, the press. Right, and the media, but they, and the public, if the public is there. They don't feel free to speak their minds, certainly, and um, they don't feel free to have fights, which is, you know... Because you have to make choices that will cost somebody something. Right, and well, certainly from a, if you're trying to serve a constituency, you don't, want to, you don't want anybody in your constituency to see you saying, yeah, okay, I'll take 10 million less for my people and you get 5 million more for your people if I can get this two years from now. I mean, that kind of stuff is ugly, right? What's the saying about things you don't want to watch being made government and sausage or whatever? Yep, yep. <laughs> but it, it, you know, also though, um, uh, the, the public piece of it also leads to more posturing. Uh, than getting to, well, what really is uh, uh, the differences uh, that folks can have? I mean, we saw that with uh, the, the public meeting uh, that Governor uh, had with the uh, legislative uh, leaders, and um, uh, they were not able to get to a real dialogue of like, all right, let's resolve what we're talking about because uh, one member started posturing. It wasn't even Joe Bruno who started posturing. It was, uh, I think it was uh, the Assembly Minority Leader started uh, posturing, and then that kind of set off everybody else, and everybody kind of stuck in, and that was what happened under Governor Pataki when they did those public meetings with the leaders. Um, uh, it didn't allow for any kind of real give and take. It's just not going to happen in the public setting. Um, uh, you have to allow for uh, an opportunity to uh, let cooler heads prevail um, and see what are really differences and how you can work your way out of those differences. Right. I think there are reasons to have, a, have private discussions, obviously, in any kind of decision making. The issue at hand really becomes what information is available and how transparent are the decisions that they made because it's important for the press to understand, mm -hmm. to ask the questions so that people can understand what happened while the decision may really be happening in private you know, ultimately the reported facts have to be transparent enough people can understand what their government's doing and follow up and, and yeah. do investigative reporting yeah. and get enough of a handle on it that let abuses and potential issues can be exposed. Well, but I think it's important to also recognize how closed many areas of government are to just your general reader. I mean, you can't pick up a budget and truly understand what it says, I don't think, in state government. and. Um, and I think that, you know, the Albany Times Union, Liz's former paper, had to sue to find out um, what the yeah. member items were and that sort of thing, having to we go to court to have... Brain, oh, really? Yeah. And yeah. It used to be that um, in, under the former governor that they would meet behind closed doors, these three met in a room meetings, and we would wait for them, the press corps, on the stairs outside the governor's office, sometimes for hours, six hours or eight hours, and they would call us and say, there's a leaders meeting, somebody would give a heads up, and we would wait. Then they would come out and give us a, some kind of Statement. accounting of what had happened in there. And we would know it broke down, it didn't break down, they're close, they're not close. You would be able to see the leaders and the governor sometimes, depending on whether he came out, and assess how it had gone from their body language, from their words. That did not happen this year. Now, I'm not advocating for sitting on the stairs for eight hours because it wasn't fun but mm -hmm. and and it wasn't open however there were a lot more opportunities where we knew that they were meeting and we had the opportunity to catch them on the way out you know and this year that was just not available one other part of the transparency that's uh, for a whole different show i don't want to get into it here is the degree to which things are paid for off budget are paid for mm -hmm. through this this whole myriad of agencies that have independent mm -hmm. bonding authority that you and I all have to pay through our tax dollars to pay for debt service before you hire a, a cop or in, in you know in in the city or a, or a teacher or anybody else. That's a whole other you know that's the probably the mm -hmm. least transparent yeah. area. Public authorities. Well, New York borrows more than any other state. Right. Mm -hmm. Let me go to please. Oh, Bettina oh, Roberts, John Jay College. Um, I just want to get a better understanding. Um, despite the governor's firm position for reform, do you feel? That the budget still, um, that the budget was successful, excuse me, or does it still need significant changes? 
both. I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I think what they achieved, they, they got some modest reforms in place and you know, they'll need to come back and do more. I mean, there are lots of, of areas that remain unaddressed and lots of compromises that had to be made that, um, you know, will need to be addressed. And I think that... Um, and it's It'll a significant achievement that finally, after years of litigation, uh, there is a CFE plan. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's a very significant uh, uh, achievement for this city uh, and for the state for planning purposes going forward. And nothing should be taken away for the fact that they were able to achieve a plan. Mm -hmm. And I think also the, um, the fact that the Medicaid cuts have been held to one, or growth in Medicaid has been held to 1% for the coming year instead of eight percent which has been the norm uh, I know the governor said that he feels as though that was his most significant achievement this year because Medicaid growth is uh, fuels the rise in in budgets for not only the state but the municipalities yes. and the counties as well and that is what makes our property taxes some go of up. that was only uh, already underway though in terms of growth reduction or s mm. the slow the slowing of growth was already underway before they got started mm -hmm. right but also though moving um, uh, towards providing the service towards uh, funding more Medicaid dollars towards providers who are dealing with Medicaid patients more is also a very significant piece. I mean, we're the right. only. I think we're the only operation. city in the country, or the only state in the country, where the state pays fifty, sp yes. pays half, and the municipality has to pay a quarter. It's of a the very cost unusual of local. There's, There's a plan right. for a takeover right. eventually. Yeah. I mean, they're moving they're, towards well, that. Well, they did a cap on local growth. They capped uh, increases at the local level to three percent, but it still is a significant burden on the localities. The, the thing about Medicaid is that it's so enormous, forty-seven billion dollar program. And it's really a program where they need to really concentrate on the needs of the people who are, uh, the program was established for. It's, for. it's for where the need is. It's for the people who are poor who need the program. And the piece that was not addressed this year that is so important to the future health of the program and for keeping it going for the people who need it is the, the, the eligibility loopholes on the long-term long -term care problem. side. Right. You know, we have 25% of all of the medically needy eligibles in the entire United States and New York State. Mm. Because we have these eligibility loopholes that allow middle, upper middle class wealthy people to get rid of their assets and get onto Medicaid. Now, Medicaid was not designed to provide health care for wealthy and well-to-do people. It, and so in order to really afford it and the other priorities that we have to trade off, we need to but deal with vote. those loopholes. Those people vote. That's the problem, right? <laughs> Uh, one of my favorite expressions, but uh, uh, Spitzer said after he was taking all this criticism about going behind closed doors, he said, you, you, you can't turn around a battleship in a bathtub. I'm not quite sure what that means, but it's a very big, you know, that, that you know, the government is this mammoth thing that, that you have to change it incrementally. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Daniel Perez, Brooklyn College. My question is, what does the future hold for Governor Spitzer in terms of his relationship with the state legislator if he continues with his steamroll approach? with his politics. Ooh, I'll take that. Take that. <laughs> <laughs> no one else wants to. No. Um, well, I mean, in some ways it's hard to say because really, again, this all comes back to next year. I mean, it, it really depends on how much... This was the honeymoon. <laughs> well, yeah, more or less. It really depends on how much he's going to put his money where his mouth is. If he is going to go after these legislators, not just by coming to their districts, but by backing reform candidates, quote-unquote, against them, by putting money up against them, and by trying to get rid of them, actually, that's a huge thing, right? I mean, it could be all out war and chaos with the legislature. Right now, this is like a little skirmish, like everybody's kind of fighting around the edges. But if he actually backs candidates against incumbents, that's a huge thing. And another big fight that's coming down the pike that's related to this is redistricting. What the governor wants to do is take the politics out of redistricting, which means drawing the lines that you talked about of the districts that enable um, incumbency protection, basically, the power to remain in the hands of the people who have it now. If he gets that, um, which I think is going to be a massive battle, then um, you're going to see some huge changes in the way that the legislature looks in Albany. But really, it's going to depend on this election year. A against a backdrop of, his, of a presidential race that's huge with all these New York candidates, I mean, next year's going to be a free-for-all. Well, I think that um, one extraordinary piece of, um, of uh, so, uh, a more solid relationship that I saw this year was Shelley Silver and um, Governor Spitzer. I think they... Um, they s supposedly went head to head over the choice of a uh, new controller. However, Shelley Spitzer backed um, 
the Shelly governor. Shelly Silver, right. Shelly Silver. That's hard. <laughs> backed, <laughs> backed the governor at 100 percent, I heard, on the, on the recent um, campaign finance issues. And I just think Which that... Which collapsed. Right. It collapsed, but he had the support of the Assembly in Shelly Silver, and I think that you see a real determination on the part of the Assembly Speaker to actually work with this governor, whereas he was always fighting with the well, previous Well, he had to. Governor. The other guy was a Republican. I mean, George, it's, he was the most powerful Democrat in the mm -hmm. state, Shelly Silver. Now you have this changing paradigm, to, to steal a word from the governor, he loves that word, but mm -hmm. you know, you have a changing paradigm where Shelly Silver is no longer the most powerful Democrat in the state, and now there's a more powerful Powerful guy, and that's a guy who really loves to but isn't be powerful, something? right? So, but, but I think Shelly Silver is a very pragmatic person, and mm -hmm. certainly he went head to head when it mattered because he was responding to his conference. His members said, "We want one of our own in this job for whatever reason," and that's a whole another show Probably too. The controller, the controller, right? That's why he was forced by his members. It was a bad spot for him to be mm -hmm. in. I don't think he wanted to go to war with the governor over that. Um, and you're going to see him go to war when he has to, when his, in order to keep his job. Um, I don't know necessarily it's going to be all ro roses and sunshine for them going forward. But, but I think the, the relationship between um, Spitzer and Joe Bruno is extraordinarily better. I mean, someone asked um, the governor a few days ago, you know, how, how do you get along with Joe Bruno? And he just started chuckling and he said, you know, we're very, I like Joe as a person. And he's chuckling the whole time. I think he's, it's, it's all show over this campaign finance reform. Joe Bruno, who's a, one of seven kids, a self-made businessman, uh, he um, is, has been essentially calling um, Governor Spitzer a rich kid. An elitist, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think, though, that there is some kind of enmity between the two of them because they're both um, so pugnacious, really. <laughs> I mean, there is a recognition. Well, Bruno was a boxer. Right. He was, he was <laughs> a boxer, <laughs> and yes. he still boxes, and he's 78 years old. I mean, the, the man is in amazing, you know, condition. But the thing is that I think that they have a recognition uh, that the other, or a little bit of a respect that the other is mm -hmm. a fighter, right? In terms of if they like each other, I have no you know, idea. We're about, to, we're about to run out of time. I think the difference between Spitzer and campaign, re and campaign reform dealing with Shelley Silver in the Assembly, there's nothing you could do that will change Democratic control mm -hmm. in the Assembly. Right. The numbers in this state are such, it'll never change. Mm -hmm. With a two-person majority in the State Senate, yes. it's very, uh, it's clear to me, it's obvious that that is a much more serious battle and all these things are, there's no way you're going to challenge. I mean, Shelley, may, Shelley Silver may face an internal Challenge from his own member, from from backbenchers, from you know, what, you know, you know, whatever the power goes on in there. But in terms of the state senate, it is their life blood, mm -hmm. and um, that's the kind of thing that we're going to be looking at over the next, over, you know, over the next couple of years as we look towards. Uh, I mean, I can't believe that, for instance, that uh, Elliot Spitzer will, in, in taking this fight to incumbent legislators, will ever go after a state senate Democrat. He may go after an assembly Democrat. He may go after state Senate Republicans. Never against a state Senate Democrat. I got the goodbye sign. I always make deadlines. <laughs> I want to thank everybody. We'll see you next time on CUNY Forum. Thanks.